Hi and welcome to the first in what will hopefully be a long and informative series on how to use Darktable. My name's Bruce Williams, you can find me at brucewilliamsphotography.com and on Instagram at bruce underscore williams underscore photography. As I'm recording this it's July 2018 and I've been using Darktable now for just short of two years so I don't claim to know everything about it but I've had some time to get familiar with it and I love it. Uh, like a lot of people I spent many years with Adobe Lightroom and there was a lot to like about Lightroom but what I didn't like was Adobe's pricing model and the way it was continually going up in price uh, and so I was looking for something else and I'd long thought about Linux as an operating system and one of the key speed humps if you like to me changing from Windows to Linux was whether or not I could find a product comparable to Lightroom and when I discovered Darktable, I was absolutely blown away. So one of the key things, of course, was once you found a product that was comparable to Lightroom was, can I bring all the work that I've done in Lightroom across to whatever this new piece of software happened to be, in this case, Darktable? And it turns out that yes, you can. So in this first video, I'm just going to run through some of the preferences for Darktable. I'm currently running on Linux Mint, which is a version of Ubuntu. But Darktable is also available on Mac and has recently been ported to Windows as well. So all of my instructional things will be centered on Linux, but hopefully a lot of it will translate to the other two platforms. Okay, so let's take a dive into the preferences of Darktable. We're currently on version 2.4.4. Now, when you first start Darktable, you'll be in the light table view. Now, if you've come from Lightroom, this is a very similar layout. You've got panels on the left and right side and a work area in the middle. Darktable will default to what Lightroom users would call grid view, where all of your images appear as thumbnails. If you want to see a single image by itself, left click once on the image, Press the Z key and you'll get a full screen, sidebars removed view of that image. Now, it'll only stay there as long as you hold the Z key. If you want it to stay sticky, use the shift modifier and that will then keep it in single image view. And you can then use your left and right arrows to toggle through the film strip of however many images you're currently looking at. If you want to get out of this single image view back into a grid view, just hit the Z key and you're back into grid view. But I said that we were going to focus on some preferences for this video, so let's do that. Up in the top right hand corner of the center section of the UI, you'll see the little cog icon for show global preferences. When you bring this up, you'll see that there are five tabs, GUI options, core options, session options, shortcuts and presets. Looking at the GUI options, you don't need to run through all of these because a lot of it you'll work out for yourself. The width of the side panels in pixels. I'm working on a full HD monitor, 1920 by 1080. I actually have two of them, but I'm only capturing one screen for these videos. Uh, I've found that 350 pixels for the side panels is a good size for me, but feel free to experiment with that if, uh, if that's either too much or too little for you. Uh, don't use embedded preview JPEG, but half size RAW. So what that means is if you tick that box, instead of using the camera's JPEG render of your RAW file, Darktable will actually use a scaled half size version of the RAW file. So if, for example, you set your camera to shoot RAW and JPEG, and you set your JPEGs to come out as black and white and high contrast because maybe you were doing a film noir shoot, I don't know. <laughs> uh, your RAW files are going to have all of their color information but the JPEG would be black and white. So clicking this option will enable Darktable to use the RAW as the preview with all of its color information rather than just the JPEG that the camera produced. Towards the bottom there are two options here expand a single light table module at a time and expand a single darkroom module at a time. Now if you've come across from Lightroom you're probably already familiar with Lightroom's solo mode which 
in Lightroom you could access by right clicking on the header for each module and selecting solo mode. And what that does in Lightroom and what this option does in Darktable is mean that whenever you click on one of these modules, either on the left or the right side of the UI, whether you're in Lighttable or any of the other areas of Darktable, only that module will be expanded. Whatever other module you were working in prior will become collapsed. So if I select geotagging, this export selected module will get collapsed, like so. So that's a handy one to have activated. Border around image in darkroom mode. I've set this quite low, down to about five pixels. What it does in the darkroom module is create this little five pixel border across the top and bottom of the image. If this was a much more panoramic crop of an image, that five pixel border would be relevant to the left and right sides. Just as an example, if I go to the crop module and I go give me two to one and expand this out and double click, you can see now that that five pixel border is relevant down the left and the right sides of the image. So that border around image in dark room mode will just allow you to choose how much of a border you have between your image and the other parts of the UI. The second last option here, rating an image one star twice will not zero out the rating. So by default, keys one, two, three, four, and five above your QWERTY keys on your keyboard will assign a star rating of one to five stars for an image or a sequence of images. And if you've rated an image one star and you press the one key again, Darktable assumes that you want no star rating on that image. So that's the default behavior. Let's say you have an image rated five stars and you suddenly decide, no, I don't want a star rating on it at all. You can hit the one key once and it will become a one star rating, hit it a second time and the star rating is removed. If you don't want that behavior, you can tick that box so that it will just assume, okay, you want a one star rating even though you've pressed the one key multiple times. Moving on to core options, halfway down you'll see write sidecar file for each image. Now this is the bit that I think Lightroom users will be most excited about. Lightroom by default stores all the things that you've done to an image, whether it's star ratings, color ratings, tags, keywords, any other kind of metadata, and all of the developing that you've done on your images in what it calls an LRCAT file, a Lightroom catalog file. And it's essentially a database file that lives on your system and if anything ever happens to that Lightroom catalog file and it gets corrupted, you're toast. You've lost everything unless you've got a backup. However, there is an option in Lightroom that is not enabled by default. Why, I don't know. But anyway, such as it is, in Lightroom there is an option very similar to this that says write all the metadata to Sidecar XMP files. So if you want to leave Lightroom and come to Darktable, what you can do is enable that option in Lightroom, then go to your grid view and select the option that says view my entire library, go control A to select all of your images, and then go control S. It's a save, right? That's, that's the standard default save keyboard shortcut for just about every app in existence. And what that will do is churn away through your entire image catalog and write everything that you've done, all your keywords, all your star ratings, all your color ratings, all your developing tweaks for every single image to an individual XMP sidecar file right alongside where the image file lives on your system. Just as an example, I will bring up my file browser. I'll go to my photos drive, go photos, go Let's just go personal projects, let's go 2018, let's go whatever was last. And there we can see a single image and beside it a file with the image name, 
the image extension and .xmp. And that's the file that Darktable has created for that particular raw file. Now, if I go back to something like here, you will see that there are two XMP files beside all of my images here. The versions of the XMP file, which say that they are a text file and just have the image name and .xmp, they're the versions that were created by Lightroom. But when I imported these images into Darktable, Darktable reads the Lightroom version of the XMP file and then creates its own version of the XMP file which includes the file extension for the type of file that it was, in my case ARW for Sony RAW files. So I could, if I wanted to, go through my system, find all of these text files that don't have the file extension in the file name and I could delete them all because I'm not going back to Lightroom. It's on my to-do list, okay? So that's the beautiful part. If you want to come from Lightroom across to Darktable, follow those steps I mentioned earlier, and all of these XMP files will appear alongside your existing images, and you will then be able to import all of your images into Darktable, and Darktable will read all of the metadata, all of the keywords, all the tags, all the developing that you did in Lightroom, and it'll be accessible through Darktable. Now it's not without its little hiccups here and there, but it's generally pretty good. I would say 98% of the work that I had done over the years that I used Lightroom, I was able to access through Darktable. There was maybe 2% that I had to tweak. So it's pretty good. Okay, moving on to session options. This is where you tell Darktable the base directory naming pattern. So essentially, where's the master folder that all of your photos are going to live in? For me, it's media slash USR slash photos local slash photos slash family photos. Now, one minor annoyance with Darktable is that this particular field doesn't have a browse button. So if you want to import images into a different folder, you've either got to write it in manually here or you need to go to your file browser, find the folder that you want, and grab that path, control C to copy, jump back over here and paste it in. I chose the same address as what was already there, but you get the idea. So it's a little bit painful in that respect if you want to segregate your images up into different folders. Now you might be thinking, why would I want to break all of my images up into separate folders? Well, if, like me, you're doing all different types of shoots, you might want to keep them all separated. Like I don't want my family photos mixed in with my commercial work. So that's one reason. Then you've got the subdirectory naming pattern. Personally, I prefer year and then inside a year folder, a year, month and day folder. The beauty of this is that even if you're importing images off a memory card days, weeks, or months after they were shot, that folder creation process will be based on the EXIF data of the images concerned. So Darktable will go and create folders for each day on which you took images and put the relevant images into each of those folders. You've then got a file naming pattern. Personally, I don't rename my files, but if you want to, you certainly could use a job name in this field. For professional photographers, and particularly for those on Linux, I would highly, highly recommend you go and search for a piece of software called Rapid Photo Downloader. It does this in a much nicer way. It has a nice GUI, and it's a lot easier and simpler to just point to a folder and go, this is where I want my images to be imported to. It does mean it becomes a two-step process because you use Rapid Photo Downloader to download the images from your memory card to your hard drive and you then import from that folder those images into Darktable. But it's a pretty quick process, so I really don't mind doing it. Then we've got shortcuts. As you spend more time with Darktable, you'll realise that there are certain things you do a lot that you want to assign a keyboard shortcut for. 
So you can go into any of these four options here, the global shortcuts, the image operations, the modules or the views, find the option that you want and assign a keyboard shortcut. And it's as simple as scrolling down through the menu, finding the option you want, double clicking on it and you'll see press key combination to remap. You then use whatever keyboard shortcut you want to assign to that particular function and then just click away from it and it will be there. So if I wanted to say reset module parameters, let's make that control R. So go control R and that is now assigned just like that. All right, I'm not going to worry about presets and we will leave it there for this particular video. I'm going to aim to get one of these videos out every week. Uh, love to hear your thoughts or feedback either in the comments or you can email me through my website and we'll talk to you soon.